and this thing. We are recording now. So the process of the way that this works is um, all three of us will provide as much information as we can. Madison has put together this presentation to keep us in line um, with the information we're providing you. Um, we do ask that if you have questions, we are watching via a phone, um, but if we miss your question, we will go back after this recording and answer your questions via Facebook. So um, please don't take anything as if we uh, missed it on purpose because we're just trying to get through this information for you, record it, and then we will answer questions um, at a later time if we don't answer it during this process. So um, Madison, why don't you start us off with uh, the first slide? Yeah, sure. So this, um, again, is a consolidated lodging tax application workshop presentation. It's important for every applicant to review this recording and um, pay attention to these slides as this year, um, watching this and being a part of it will actually be a graded component in the application. And um, uh, something to note is that the submission deadline is Friday, October 1st which I like to really say September 30th, 2021, the day before, <laughs> just in case of emergencies at four o'clock sharp. This is something different. If you have done this in the past, the, um, the reminder is, is there is a change. It is four o'clock that this has to be submitted by. Yes, and we'll repeat it. Friday, October 1st at four o'clock, usually, we ask that, uh, that uh, you submit it a day in advance, and especially this year, it's even an hour quicker, 4 p.m. on October 1st, um, even a minute later, the applications will not be received. And some other dates to note while you're in your calendar is the oral presentations, which are on Friday, November 19th this year. And um, the applicant award notification and fund availability is coming soon, but it should be posted within a week of the committee decision of funding. Any reports which are produced as a result of a grant reward have to be also submitted within 60 days of completion for projects um, or of your event for events, of course, to be reimbursed for funding. So going into 2021, how are things different from last year? We saw the lodging tax application change up a lot in 2020 due to the pandemic. And again, it's changed just slightly again in 2021. We do have a video workshop again this year, and this will be on our chamber website on the county lodging tax page and live on Facebook for you to watch at your convenience. I noticed a lot of folks last year like to actually have the recording up next to them as they were filling out their application or watch the recording again once before they submitted it to make sure that they had all of the notes applied to their application. The deadline is 4 p.m. sharp on Friday, October 1st. Um, and this year, the workshop presentation, what you're watching right now, must be reviewed by the applicant. So if you're an organization or a business and you have a small team, you can't have one person watch it and then another person um, submit the applicant. The name has to be the same on both. This year, um, we, in 2020, we had compared 2019 data to, what was it, 2020 projected, Taylor? Um, one. Yep. 2021 projected. So this year is a little bit different. You will be able to choose your year for the past. Um, if you had hosted your event in 2020, you can definitely use 2020 as a past number. If you didn't and you want to use 2019, that works great too. You'll actually be able to plug that in um, manually in the application. And um, as far as projected, if your event is in 2022, it should be 2022, but you will be able to edit that as well. And a point just real quick, Madison, is in this application, it is always recommended that if you don't want to give the information, you may take that risk of not putting that information, which may, may or may not work on your behalf. 
Um, so we do recommend that even if you are a, an event that did not have an event in 2020, please go back to recorded information that you might be able to use in this section. So don't take it as if you canceled that you don't have to fill this information out. Please use data sets that you have in the previous years. Yes, um, and so another big component that is a little bit different this year is there is a video component. Um, we noticed that the oral presentation day was taking up a lot of time and energy um, on both sides, both the applicants and the reviewers. So this year we will have a video upload section for you to tell your story behind your event or your project. Um, in your organization. That way we can keep it short and you can answer any questions the day of the oral presentation. And then there's some specific logo, logo rules for digital ads that changed over this last year that we'll go into later in the presentation. Taylor, am I missing anything here? <laughs> Uh, just for the video upload, uh, it won't be a spot where you can manually upload a spot. It'll have to be a link. So you'll have to host the video on a different platform. It could be your own website, it could be YouTube, but it'll just be a spot for a link. So you will have to host the video on a different platform. Madison and Taylor, we do have a question on Facebook. How will you know who watched or reviewed the video since it is required to be an applicant? This is an overview, so each one of these points will go into a lot more um, detail later in the presentation. And there is a slide that tells you how to let the um, committee know that you feel that you watch this, which is basically emailing Taylor and letting her know, hey, I watched the workshop, my event is X. Um, and so whoever sends that email would be the same name on the application, correct, ladies? Mm -hmm. Correct. And we'll go over that more and answer any other questions as well by the end. Okay, so use of funds. This hasn't changed much for applicants that are um, reviewing this year over year. You can use lodging tax funds for tourism marketing, the marketing and operations of special events and festivals designed to attract tourists from outside of our county, outside of 50 miles or further. Um, supporting the operations and capital expenditures of tourism related facilities owned or operated by a municipality or a public facilities district or supporting the operations of tourism related facilities owned or operated by nonprofit organizations. Some examples of things that you could qualify for lodging tax reimbursement for are employee travel and training, your marketing, communication, advertising, this tends to be a really big one. Your supplies for office supplies, IT support, if you are renting a facility or chairs or anything um, rental wise that you need to put on your event, that would be allowed. Equipment hire, training your volunteers, transportation, and then speaker talent entertainment fees. Things that are not allowed and that we've seen canceled in the past um, and not eligible for reimbursement would be prizes for contestants, resale items, um, food and drinks, beautification, anything fundraising if you're just trying to raise money for your organization specifically, um, payroll for your own employees, rent or mortgages, this does not count for that, um, insurance, permits, contra contract labor costs, um, and capital purchases and asset purchases. And I made a note on this slide that a capital purchase is an item with three plus years of life and, and or costs over $5,000. So maybe you could get a banner reimbursed, but not a brand new laptop for your organization. It has to be very specific to that event or project. Um, and another tip here is to not use blanket operation, um, the word operation as a statement in the list of intended use of funds. It's just a little too broad and the committees are looking for a little bit more um, specifics on what you're planning to use the funds for. 
So we have another uh, question that uh, comes along with these topics. Would physical renovations like replacing of a lighting system be allowed? And I would have to say, no, that would fall under the capital purchases and asset purchases. So as Madison pointed out, usually the committee will review that. And if it has three or more years of life and costs over 5,000, it's still not allowable. Uh, what we do recommend if you're looking at physical renovations, um, there's some other opportunities that we can help you with those capital funds. Reach out to us. We have our uh, contact information on the last slide. So there's options for that too, but that would be included as beautification um, mm -hmm. and would not be eligible. And I, I recommend when filling out your lodging tax application to compare your intended loose use of funds in the beginning of the application with your budget near the end mm -hmm. and make sure that you're getting everything because if it's listed here as intended use of funds, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to spend the money on everything or a certain amount towards everything, but you wanna almost put out there anything that you could go for reimbursement for so that you are eligible to get that for those funds. Here are a few definitions, which are found on the county lodging tax page two, but I thought I'd lift list them here. What is tourism? It's an activity uh, resulting from tourists and it may include sales of overnight lodging, meals, tours, economic mm -hmm. stimulation to our community, heads and beds. Tourism promotion, so anything that develops tourism, a lot of that goes hand in hand with marketing. A tourism related facility is a property with usable life of three or more years. Um, it is constructed by volunteers and owned by a public entity, owned by a nonprofit organization, used to support tourism, performing arts, anything that would attract tourists. And then operation of tourism related facility. This is basically services of the operation and management of a facility, um, leisure facilities and activities, foods and drink, um, and access to cultural, historical sites, anything tourism related in the operation that goes into that, which would need to be clearly defined in your application. Here are a few notes from the webmaster at the county for the actual technical side of submitting your application. Um, this is linked and again, we'll provide these slides on the Kittitas County Chamber and the Kittitas County Lodging Tax websites so you can click on the link here to start a form. Um, and if you are a first time applicant, you will need to create an account. So make sure you're not submitting this an hour before the deadline that you're giving yourself enough time to do so. Um, what we recommend is to create a document with your responses, copy and paste application questions, put it in a document on Word or Google Docs or anything that's safe and um, map out your, your brainstorming of how you want to respond to each question and have it ready so that when you plug it into the application, you know exactly what you're putting in and you're not doing that brainstorming within the application. We've had issues before where people have clicked out of the application or their computer had died or their Wi-Fi went out and they lost everything. And so we wanna make sure that our applicants are protected and that they are taking the measures necessary, just having a piece of content, a document with everything you wanna plug in. It's also nice to be able to look back on once you have submitted it. Definitely, and I will add that this year, we do have a link to a Word document right above the actual application. So we have provided that, it has all the questions. We do recommend that you only type out your narrative responses because there will be some button clicking questions that won't translate well, especially once you get down to the budget section, you're wanna go, going to want to do that inside the application. Otherwise it's really going to get mucked up in the copy and paste. And then once you're in the application, the website times out pretty fast. So you have to be active in your application or just save a draft, even if it, I think it times out after like 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So if you're working in it, save it really frequently. Um, otherwise you will get backed out to your last save draft. 
This is also a good measure to do the document that's being provided by the county or one of your own. Um, and it's always good that when you're filling out the application to share your responses with other people on your board or maybe another active member of your event um, so that they can review it um, and make any suggestions or changes. So then, like Madison said, you guys can brainstorm your responses that are going to be appropriate for you to be successful as an applicant. So we do highly recommend that you do do a separate documentation just to help you through this process. And diving right into the application, a lot of this will look similar for those who have applied for lodging tax funds in the past. It'll ask you for your business name, contact information for the applicant. Make sure that this is the same person who watched this workshop and then emailed Taylor um, an email confirming that you had done this. Um, an event name or your grant project name you also will need to upload a W-9 if you are representing a business or your IRS designation letter for your nonprofit if you are representing a nonprofit. You will then go into describing your grant project or event in the summary. This is the same as last year, including the start date, end date. If it's a one day event, this date will be the same. Um, your location for your event, amount of funding requested, and then the list of intended funds. So make sure you go to that slide a couple slides back and see what is allowed and what may not be. This is, again, word for word translated right into your contract, depending on what the committee decides to be eligible for. So overcompensate by including things. If you're not sure if you need um, reimbursement for your marketing, maybe you will, maybe you won't, just add it in so that you're protected and that you can be reimbursed in the future. Keep it broad, but cover everything and anything that you can put in there. You will also include the tourism season, so it'll have a multiple choice option for if it's high season, shoulder season, or during the winter months, and you can just choose there depending on what month it is. And um, a narrative component, why would tourists travel to Kittitas County to attend your event activity facility? Anything I'm missing here, ladies? No, just really that list of intended use of funds is going to be one of the major components of the application. Mm -hmm. And if you have questions about intended use of funds, if it's not on the slide with the allowed and not allowed, feel free to call the chamber. We're happy to clarify if we think something would not or would qualify for um, reimbursement. We've worked closely with this project for this process for years. So um, when in doubt, call us up. We got you. <laughs> Another piece is in the beginning of the application, again, it will be a graded question to complete the workshop and it will be recorded and saved online. When you're done with it, uh, again, on the last slide, you'll find Taylor's information and instructions on how to confirm that you have completed this workshop. Um, but just, just to confirm once more, the person who is watching this workshop and completing it and emails Taylor also needs to be the name on your application, even if you're in the same organization and representing the same application and you worked on it together. It needs to be one person um, that is also the person on your video that you're submitting in the application and the person that is doing the oral presentation and answering questions on that day. And I would just add a little bit on that. You don't have to go back is um, the reason we're really pushing that um, clarification is we have found during our dispute boards um, there are different people speaking at different times which then most of the time we'll get a response that said oh i didn't know that was in the application so we really want to make sure that you understand as an applicant this application is a exhibit to your contract. So everything that is in line with your contract will always go back to your application. So that's why we're really making it a very clear direction this year, just so that um, everybody understands that this is what they're looking at from a contractual uh, piece of it. Yes. Yep. 
And um, this year, there will again be that video requirement. You'll have up to seven minutes to explain your organization, your event, your project, um, why you're asking for funding and what you need help supporting financially. It doesn't need to be a full seven minutes, but we really want more than like a minute of speaking. We want a full background on who you are, why you like funding, what you're expecting for your event in 2021. And again, like Taylor said, you're gonna submit that via a link. You're not gonna be able to directly upload it. This is another reason why it's really important not to wait until the day of the deadline to submit because it can, you know, you guys know how video loading time is. Uploading your video online somewhere, whether that's YouTube, Google Drive is really easy. Um, and you can share and just copy a link and upload it that way. Um, it can take a little while. So you don't wanna be waiting until the last minute and then feeling stressed to submit on time because that is a very sharp deadline and there are not any exceptions. So YouTube, you could do your website, um, anywhere really that you could get a link. Again, Google Drive, you could really quickly upload it on your phone if you have the app downloaded, click share copy link, make sure that you have sharing permissions so that anyone can see it. And then you can just paste that link in your application. The intention of this again is to save time during the oral presentation day so that the um, committee understands the background of your event. They understand who you are and they can prepare their questions and clarifications before. So when you do show up, you can give a quick little synopsis and the committee can ask you specific questions and hear your responses. Um, and that person who submits the video and the application should also be the representative during the oral presentation day as well. So Madison, there was a question on Facebook in regards to these video introductions. Um, I'm assuming that these are the introductions to clarify some of the questions that have happened during the application, which is why we didn't get any additional questions, was there is a difference between seeing creatively a video to black and white written descriptions. And so maybe it'll engage the, um, <clears throat> the reviewers a little bit more. So for that person that's asking on Facebook, it, I know it feels like overkill, but it really is gonna probably make it a lot simpler and may engage more questions from the committee itself. So um, this is just something that uh, is new this year. And obviously when you try something new, there's always gonna be some corrections and suggestions, but we hope that you will just follow through this process. And if you need additional assistance on uh, submitting your videos or even doing your videos, again, the chamber is happy to help with that. Yes, good point. It doesn't need to be fancy. You can do one take. You don't need to do any editing. That's not graded or anything. Um, and I think it's also nice for those who are nervous and don't like to speak in front of people and they don't want that to influence their score or anything. This is great. You can do as many takes as you'd like and upload it. And again, like Amy said, if you need a good background or someone to record you, um, hit up the chamber. We have resources and places to do that where we can help you submit it as well. Some additional questions. This is a hot topic, which is okay, because it's new. Um, for the video portion, can they involve several of their board members in the video or is it required only to be that one person? Taylor, I'll let you take that sure. one. Yeah, the committee really just, so instead of the oral presentations coming up and saying, this is our organization, this is what we do, that's what they want in the video. So definitely you can have your board talk about the events, its past successes. This is your time to really hype up your event and explain why you do the event, what your organization is about. So as long as the committee um, really wants it between, you know, four to seven is that sweet spot, but it's not a you know, seven minute cutoff, you you exceeded it, so it's done. Um, but try to keep it a little bit, you know, 10 minutes maximum, I'd say, uh, but really just about your organization and what it's about. That way, when it does come time for the oral presentations, it's really just committee comments on the application once it's been graded. So you won't have to rehash any of this, the I represent this organization, this is what we do. It'll really just be about committee comments and any questions that they have. 
So ladies, I have a follow-up question because I think somebody's probably thinking the same question, so I'll just get it out there. So if they have an event that happens after the application deadline, what you're saying is this is a video to introduce the organization and why they're requesting the funding, correct? Yeah. So during the oral presentations, would they also have the opportunity for what we'll consider a promotional video to follow up on what they described on their introduction video? That is interesting. I don't think that they have thought about that. We did have a spot for a little media um, previously. So I'd say, you know, a really quick PowerPoint would probably be all right for the committee during that oral presentation. They really did want to cut it instead of having that, you know, six hour and then plus deliberation. They kind of want to make it really short, sweet, get everybody in all the questions asked so that everyone can get out um, before 5 p.m. Okay, so um, just to clarify my question for those that are watching, this video introduction is definitely the opportunity to explain who you are, why you do the event, and what you think draws tourism to your event. So it's very specific. So it's an introduction video. If you do want to do a promotional video, I would say we'll get clarification as we get closer to the oral presentations to give you some guidance in regards to media availability during that day. It Hopefully that like, answers. Yeah, it's an oral presentation just like how you would have done in person last year or this yeah. year. You're doing the same thing, introducing yourself, organization, what you're asking for funding for. Yeah. You know, like Taylor said, boasting about some of your successes, maybe quickly going over the last crazy year or two and how that's impacted you and then your vision for the future. Don't overthink it, but let us know if you have questions or clarify. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right. <clears throat> so then there's a description section and there's two different descriptions. There's a project or a nonprofit who's acting asking for funding, but they're not necessarily having an event. They have a tourism related project or focus for their nonprofit. Um, so this is an example for a museum, just saying that the project is designated to create increased tourism, museum attendance, membership, and historical awareness through XYZ, their, their variations of marketing. Um, they say that these funds will be used wisely to achieve a successful marketing and advertising campaign geared towards tourism and the mission of the museum. They say how they're going to execute that plan and their target audiences. So they keep it to about a, a paragraph, you know, probably what, six to eight sentences here, but really give a good text overview of the description of what they're asking for funds for. And then the next one is an event example. If you're hosting an event, what should you include in your description? The name of your event, how much does it cost for people? What is it supposed to be? How do you envision it? If you've done it before, you can include your event description that you use on your Facebook event or your website. Um, but then tell the committee a little bit beyond that. How is it gonna go down? Are you having vendors? Are you having entertainers? How has it worked in the past? Um, and how is it tourism related? I think that's a big point that we try to punctuate each year is in your event description, you're really going to want to make an effort to communicate how is it tourism related and how are you tracking that? Another point in the application is COVID-19 info, it's called, and it's just asking if you did plan an event in 2020 or 2021, first of all, congratulations, that's awesome, um, if it was safe. And just give a little narrative on if it was able to take place or not, what successes and challenges you encountered. Um, please remember this is not a weighted question and it is not going to be graded at all. It's just to give the committee 
a little bit of background knowledge on maybe why you're comparing certain years in your budget um, or why you were asking for a certain amount of funding going into 2022. So if you did host an event, let them know how it went. Maybe you, um, it looked different than it normally was, but it still was successful. That's great to punctuate. And maybe you had to cancel it because of whatever reason, your demographic or your event. Um, so just explaining that here will help give them a good background. And then as far as attendance, you will again include a past actual, which it doesn't need to be 2020 or 2021. You will be able to plug that in. And then a projected estimate for 2022. The number of people who traveled more than 50 miles for your event or activity. And again, past actual, and then the people who you project in 2022. If you didn't host your event in 2020 or 2021, we, correct me if I'm wrong, Taylor and Amy, but we recommend comparing when you did host your event. So don't plug <laughs> in a bunch of zeros for 2020 um, and then, or 2021 and then try to compare it to what you expect for 2022. We really want this to be data driven. And then same thing as it has been in the past, number of people who traveled from outside of Washington state, your past actual, and, and later it'll ask how you tracked that, but um, number of people who came from outside of the state and what you're expecting for that for 2022 as well. Keep in mind, these are projections. And so it doesn't need to be specific. If you say that 50 people came to Washington for your event, you know, in 2020 or 2019, and you think 75 will in the future, you don't have to get 75 people necessarily. This is a projection and it's, a, it's an estimate. And if you need help determining what that looks like, again, you can contact us at the chamber and we're ha happy to help assist with that. Another part is heads and beds. So the people who stayed in accommodations in Kittitas County, what your past actual was for that and what you're projecting for your 2022 event. And then the number of paid lodging room nights resulting from your event in the past and in the future. And we use, um, there are an average of 2.5 people in a hotel room um, every night. And so if you find the number of people who stayed in paid accommodations, it's easy to do the math and figure out how many lodging room nights on average it could be. But again, it depends on your tracking, it depends on your data from past years. And if you have any blurriness or haziness with these numbers, please contact us here at the chamber and we're happy to sit down and help you through that application. This is a lot of technicality. So am I missing anything, ladies? I just pop in and say, this is the, these last couple slides are really about your strategic plan of your event. Um, we don't expect you to have all the correct answers and will we and you will not be tested on the exact answers right yeah. so um, it's just a strategic plan so we kind of understand what your process is as an organization remember as we introduce the video introduction we still have some of these attendance requirements you will still have that opportunity to update the committee if you are doing this application prior to your 2021 event so again, use this as a strategic process that you're doing your best calculations for, and then use the uh, oral presentation to give a slight change if you have an event after the deadline. It'll also ask you your methodology for these things with the quantitative numbers, which I'll include a slide with a description for each one of these, but basically how did you come up with these numbers? Did you do a survey? Did you stand at your event and try to count the amount of people coming in? Um, did you count tickets? Did you use your Google Analytics? Did you stand at the front and mark every time that a person came in? Um, that's going to be a, an important uh, component for those quantitative answers. As well as host hotel, did you partner with a hotel for your event? The answer should almost always be yes. If you can, um, it, I think that it's important to, in any event, make sure that you're partnering with the hotel 
And I know a lot of our hotels are happy to do that. They want to have um, special packages or at least be aware of events that are happening within their region. And so make sure that if you do have that conversation with the hotel, you are including that in your application. And previous successes. Describe the prior successes of your event, activity, or facility in attracting tourists. So again, this is your place to write out a quick description. How have you been successful in the past in driving tourism to Kittitas County? Focus on that instead of um, our museum has grown a lot, our membership has grown a lot. That's great and we want to see that too, but it's important for the applicant to keep in mind how has it been successful in attracting tourists here from outside of Kittitas County? As far as impact, there's a question on self-sustaining. Again, this is a year-over-year, -year, very black and white question. What plans exist to allow this project to become self-sustaining? Include ticket sale plans, sponsors, or other cost recovery models. So this is really important for events that are um, especially not coming in with a taking home money at the end of the day and they need this lodging tax application and these funds to make their event happen, what are your plans to be able to support it in the future years down the road? The lodging tax application process really is for new upcoming events, um, exciting new projects, and the hope is that the county can help support these projects and events in developing so that they can be self-sustaining down the road. So you can quickly explain how you expect your ticket sales to go up. Are you going to be transferring to a bigger venue or using more venues in the future? Maybe you're um, changing your one day event to a two or three day or having an after party or a pre-funk event the night before. Um, as far as sponsors, how do you expect that to grow? This again, you can kind of get creative with and include how you're expecting to grow years down the road. Am I forgetting anything, ladies? On that, no, okay, good. Marketing, so how do you expect to promote your event activity or facility to attract tourists? Again, um, make sure that this is tourism related. So you may do uh, ads on 88.1 The Berg, but that might not be the best um, radio station to attract tourists or to go into detail on for your marketing. Um, make sure that you are mentioning that your marketing will be um, put out to audiences that are beyond 50 miles outside of where your event will be held. And then for community, describe how you will promote lodging establishments, restaurants, and businesses located in Kittitas County. Um, have you collaborated or created partnerships with organizations or events that are close to your event date? And how is this accomplished? So if you're an organization doing a project or if you are an event, there's always a lot of partnership involved. This again is your opportunity to call up all your partners and say, hey, I'm putting you on my lodging tax application. I wanna work with you in this way, X, Y, Z. It doesn't need to be um, black and white so specific as to how many flyers are gonna print exactly, but um, just mention your partners and kind of boast about your relationship here. As far as branding and using the county tourism uh, logos on your lodging tax marketing, this information is on the county lodging tax page, but I also wanted to include it here so that um, as you're starting to plan this, you're realizing where the logos will have to be placed, um, which are on the next slide, I'll show you in a second. But if you have a website, they must include the counties and city tourism website logo. Um, the logo must be displayed on the home page and can't be smaller than a half inch in height. And it actually has to be easily read. It has to be legible. It can't be the same color as the background. Um, and a big point on these logos is that you cannot change the logo in color or appearance. So please do not crop it. Please do not um, change it up to fit your branding. It really needs to stay specific to what it is and um, 
we've seen that become an issue in the past. People just don't know. So please take note of that. Print and online ads of all types must include the county's or city's tourism logo. Obviously, um, the print ones won't have a link to our Central Washington Outdoor Tourism website, but the logo must be, again, no smaller than a half an inch. You have to be able to read it and you can't edit it to make it any different. And then video advertising of all types. So organic videos, uh, if you're advertising on TV or um, online, those must include the tourism website logo as well. Again, can't be way too small. It needs to be easily read and you cannot edit. And then these are the logos. So if you need any of these logos, they're on the Chamber website. There's a link on the Kittitas County Lodging Tax page to these logos. Um, again, you can also just email us at the Chamber and we can direct you when in doubt. But if you are hosting an event in Kittitas County, you'll have to use the centralwashingtonoutdoor.com logo. And there's two different options. One of them is like the full logo with outdoor.com at the bottom but we noticed that some applicants that weren't necessarily outdoor oriented um, wanted something that still had the URL there, but wasn't so much of an outdoorsy brand. So right next to it, you will find the Central Washington Outdoor Lodging Tax Funds logo. Either one of them work great, but if you're hosting an event or doing a tourism related project in Kittitas County and you wanna be reimbursed for lodging tax funds, you'll have to use one of them. <laughs> and when in doubt, ask the chamber. And then if you are hosting an event in Cleelum or in Ellensburg, there are specific city lodging tax logos for those as well. So if I'm in Cleelum and I am creating a brochure that I am going for lodging tax reimbursement for, I would use the Discover Cleelum green logo and one of the Central Washington Outdoor ones. If I was in Ellensburg, I would use the Ellensburg, myellensburg.com one and then one of the Central Washington Outdoor ones. And if I'm in Roslyn or somewhere in the county that is not Discover Cleelum or myellensburg.com, you're going to just use the county logo. Either one of those is fine. And again, the logos can be found on the media room pages at centralwashingtonoutdoor.com, myellensburg.com, and discovercleelum.com. I left that at the bottom of the slide too. So in short, <laughs> there are several resources you can get these logos from. And I would have to say from this application process, the number one dispute in this process is these logos. And so I will put it out there. Madison just mentioned five different resources that you can get these logos to be able to get reimbursed appropriately. The budget section is a plug and play section. And so again, you can, if you want, copy the budget section and paste it and try to figure it out. But this might be something that while you're filling out your application, you're not using your document for, you're just including last year's numbers and what you're projecting for 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question on potential changes. What changes will be made if funding for your request is not available or recommended? So. If you don't get any lodging tax funding or if it's way less than what you asked for, what does that look like for your event? Does that mean you can't host it because you have no startup costs and you're just trying to figure it out? Does that mean that you will have to remove certain entertainment and you see that ticket sales would go down because of that because people would come specifically for an entertainer? Um, whatever that might look like for you, a different venue, um, just specify that before you go into your budget numbers. The budget will look the same as years past, except for being, to being able to plug in a certain year instead of 2021 for your past and then um, for your projected, your planning for 2022. There are provided spaces for this that will pertain to your project or event. Um, and it will ask about matching funds as well for funding, funding sources. It will include anticipated revenue, expenses, any potential P&L. So bust out your binders or whatever you use to track all of that in the last year and, um, 
and this is a good time to just plug it in and also for your board or your organization team to start looking at what are your goals as a team to increase your revenue in 2022. This is why it's so important to jump into the application and look at these questions way before the deadline so that you guys can get on the same page too about what might be easy to um, up your revenue and lower your expenses going into the next year. For projects or events that are ongoing for more than a year, you will need to submit app actuals from the previous three years of operations for the project and proposal, if applicable. Even though you'll be able to plug in certain years, um, we are still asking for previous numbers as well. One and question that really isn't uh, talked about, and I don't know if it's your next slide, Madison, so correct me. Um, in the previous years, we used to um, do subject to 10%. And I know earlier in the Facebook feed, there was a question if that was still going to happen. Is that still a, a process of this application? I'll let yes. you take that one, Taylor, yeah. Yeah, so um, at the very beginning of the application, there's one that says, is this a new project or an ongoing project? Um, ongoing is anything after three years. And if it's ongoing, you're only able to request 10% of your total operating budget for the event. Um, and that is really just so we can focus more on the new and up and coming ones that don't have as much. So on ongoing events, 10% of the budget is what you're able to request here. And it auto calculates that, right, Taylor? As they're plugging in their numbers, if it says it's an ongoing event, it should mm -hmm. come up with their ask. And so, yep. we, okay, good. And when you're doing that, if you are an ongoing event, you can find that number at the bottom of your budget and plug that in for your ask for, uh, for your money, for your total contract um, request. So um, that's another easy way to do it if you read your application seven times over before you submit it like I do. <laughs> Well, and one of the things that I want to point out, sorry, Madison, um, is on this budget point, we're going to go all the way back to when Madison said to make sure that your intended use of funds, that you don't shorten yourself. A lot of times when you do these applications in an advanced status, I'll give an example. We have an October event for the Chamber of Commerce. We are now filling out an application for 2022, which we have not yet started our 2021. And so we're just estimating these numbers. And we just recommend that if you have a strategic plan that may have a number that you're not quite sure, but you're doing your best estimate on that, you want to make sure it falls into place. So it falls into place with your intended uses. It falls into place with your strategy description that's in the application. And you also want to make sure that it is um, received correctly under the budget line item so that when you get through this process, you're able to um, act on those um, appropriately. It also means that you may estimate through your strategy a certain um, expenditure and you may have to change your mind in that year's time, but at least you have it in your intended use so that when it goes to the contract that you are still eligible for that reimbursement, whichever way it may work out in that time frame. So please don't think, well, I just don't know what I'm going to do. And so you leave it out. And then you have a wishful thought that you would have put it into your contract. Really make sure that you're brainstorming what you can do to grow your event and make sure that's applicable in all sections. Yes. And if you're a reoccurring event, go to your expenses last year, pull up all your receipts and make sure that everything that you can be reimbursed for is in your intended use of funds. Mm -hmm. um, and then, when you are brainstorming with your board or your team, what are you hoping for in the future? What's your dream entertainment? Um, make sure that you also include those plans as well. Especially coming out of the pandemic, um, I know that for the chamber, we are looking at our budget numbers and you're going to come into supply issues. And so with um, the cost uh, that might come upon us in 2022, you want to make sure that you are projecting that potential increase of cost. 
um, in your budget process. So as a fiduciary uh, responsibility of your board, you may want to look at um, if for some reason you have to add an extra 3%, you are able to describe that to the committee of why you would have uh, estimated a little higher. Because as we come out of the pandemic and out of all of these different processes, um, there will be some supply chain issues, um, especially if like us, we have beer fest, fest happening and um, our suppliers tend to be across the world. And so it's harder to get those supplies. And so you have to take that in consideration when you're estimating your budget for your events in 2022. Yes, you can also ask for PPE. So if that's something that's important yep. for your organization, feel free to include that and overestimate as needed. I know a lot of wedding vendors right now are getting booked through 2022 already. Their whole summer are booked, photographers, entertainers, caterers. And so not only is it important to start planning early, but um, acknowledge that your budget might look a little bit different as, as vendors might also be limited in 2022. Not to scare you. <laughs> if you need vendor, a list of preferred vendors, contact the chamber. <laughs> and then as far as tracking, this is a huge part of your application and you're gonna thank yourself next year when you go to apply again. Um, it's important to track the actual numbers, your quantitative success for your event. Um, that might look like your ticket information, how many tickets you sold, surveys on site, which we really recommend. Um, you can ask folks before they buy their ticket for your event or on site, hey, it can be a part of it. What's your zip code? Include it. Have a pop-up that pops up on a website um, to include that information and capture that data. Um, you can have a booth at your event with surveys and maybe they get a raffle ticket or whatever it may be, a keychain to fill out the survey, um, asking them the questions that you fill out in your application. Are you staying in Kittitas County? Are you staying at a campground, hotel, friend's house, whatever it may be? Um, that's really a good way to get all of the quantitative information you need to answer these questions now and in the future. Your hotel packages. So if you are hosting an event in Roslyn and you partner with Hotel Roslyn, maybe they have a room block or a special rate for um, your event you can work with them to track how many people took advantage of that and how can you include that in your application and in your reporting. Same thing with specials in retail shops or restaurants. If you have a Raza Mexican Grill burrito for your event and it's very specific, you can work with the Raza Mexican Grill to come up with how many people took advantage of that, report that. Another really good straightforward thing is Google Analytics. If you're hosting an event and you don't have Google Analytics and you want help, contact the chamber and we can help get that set up for you. Um, it's important to see how many people are looking at your event page and how many people are actually clicking to sign up and buy tickets. And you can see location in Google Analytics too, so it's a lot less manual. Online ads, those provide a lot of detail as to who's clicking on them. And of course, contents and entries too. Um, you can kind of combine your survey with a fun raffle or a contest or something to get people actually wanting to do it. <laughs> a lot easier when you have something free to give them. Here is a example of a survey, which you guys are welcome to copy for your event if you'd like. It just asks, what's your zip code? How did you hear about this event? This can help track your marketing and change it in the future. Where did you stay in Kittitas County if you did stay here? Um, and this is also a good breakdown of how many people are locals that are going to your event versus how many people stayed at a hotel, campground, maybe they, they stayed with their friends and family. That's a form of tourism too. If they're traveling from outside of the county to come here and stay with friends and family, they might be buying gas, restaurants, whatever it might be. So it's, it's really good to track all of this um, on top of whatever your organization might want. So how well structured was this event? They can circle it, leave a place for them to vote on their favorite beer or their favorite entertainer. Um, leave a place for them to leave feedback on your event. It's great feedback for your team to use in internally. 
And um, again, a big part of it is to make sure you ask for their zip code, um, but mix in a fun, a fun one or two there, here and there, so that they're not just giving you all of their information. And we recommend not to ask for their full address either, as it's just not necessary. We had Dora, the auditor who looks at the re reimbursement requests, provide us some notes. I don't know, Taylor, if you want to maybe go over these from the county side, these points. Sure. Um, so you need an updated W-9 form on file, which we do send out a blank W-9 when we send out your contract. So, but you can always contact us if you need that form and you turn it in to me to get it back on file for the county. So it is on a reimbursement basis. So the applicant is required to pay the vendor in full and then submit the reimbursement requests. There is a cover sheet to go with all reimbursement requests. That's the one um, on the slide here. And then along with the applicant workshop, Dora has a auditor training. That's a PowerPoint that is required before she will accept any reimbursements. Um, again, read your contract carefully. That section two payment is where it gets transferred, that list of intended use of funds. So that is the only thing that Dora will see. She will, um, I mean, she'll see the whole contract, but that is what she'll look at when she gets the reimbursement requests is if this is in that list. And then always check your invoices, make sure that they match what you're actually asking for. It's kind of funny. She does get quite a few that are like here and there. Um, for events, we do ask that you batch your reimbursement, so you only do two requests for event-specific ones. That way, it helps with uh, the processing time, and it's not, you know, one request per week for the six weeks leading up to the event. And that batching does help. So if you are a new event that's looking to come into this process, it really does help because it's reimbursable. You could do one batch knowing very well that you have to put in deposits early for entertainers or whatnot so that you can get some cash flow back into your organization. And then the last batch could be after your event so that it would be your final invoices. So it, it works both for ongoing events and the new upcoming events to help them with a cash flow um, because it is a reimbursement only option. Yep, and then for event specific ones as well, uh, Dora does request to have all reimbursements in and finalized uh, 60 days after the completion of the event for reporting. And it's good if you're hosting an event and you come back to the office and you put all of your P&L together and talk with your team on how successful it is. We say it's really easy in any organization to just move on to the next thing. So while you're doing that and your mind is on it and you're talking with your team on it and you have all your numbers in front of you, submit it as soon as you can. You could submit it the day after your event if you have all of the data needed to submit that report. Um, but sometimes it's easier rather than moving on to the next thing and then trying to reflect back on um, some of these numbers. This is the form. Do you want to go over this, Taylor? It's pretty self-explanatory. Yep. Uh, so this is the one. And then if you go to the Consolidated Lodging Tax page on the county site, there's a couple different forms for a couple different types of reimbursements. And Doris, and you can reach out to me and I can help um, guide questions if you have any that comes along with the reporting. Um, these are all they go into a state system, which is kind of why they look a little funky. <laughs> here are the methodology definitions. So if you can see here on the worksheet, which this is one example, um, it does have method. When you compare your predicted attendance, what you put in your application to your actual, the amount of people that actually came to your event, um, it's going to ask for a method. And on the other side of the sheet, you'll find the various methods for finding these numbers. Um, you can also, when you're deciding how you're going to do this, come to this page, look at these definitions, and it'll give you some ideas. Are you actually directly counting? Is it an estimate based on your raffle tickets or 
um, your brochures handed out? Is it a representative survey? So you are doing a survey with some people and uh, using it as numbers for your entire event. Is it an informal survey, which is not necessarily representative of all the visitors or participants, um, but maybe a few or a structured estimate. Um, so one jurisdiction estimated attendance by dividing the square footage of the event area by the building code allowance for people. So these can get a little bit hazy. That's why it's really important to just, I think, always do a survey, always, always ask for um, the zip code if you have online registration in advance. Do it as specific as possible, but um, if you need some inspiration for how to do that, the definitions are here, and you will need to um, explain that with all of your numbers when you report to the county. And that's pretty much it, y'all. You did it. If you watched this and you completed this workshop, then that means that you can email Taylor, her Taylor, her Taylor Crouch uh, at Kittitas County. What, uh, email is right here. And you basically can just say, hey, I am Susie. I'm running the Central Washington Nutcracker event. And I completed the application. That's it. And um, as long as Susie is the one who will be, or the workshop, I'm sorry, as long as Susie is the one submitting the application, that is all that is needed. Um, and again, this will be a question on the application that is asked and scored that it is the same person completing this workshop. And with that, we're here to help. Uh, Amy's email is right here, amy at kittitaskcountychamber.com. But both Amy and Taylor are available indefinitely from now on for anyone to reach out to in regards to the entire lodging tax process from developing your application. If you're feeling overwhelmed and you need to talk to us and get some structure here, we're happy to help all through your application and through the actual um, event too or the project. We're happy to help with reporting afterwards um, and whatever may be. So. That's what I have for you. Anything else, Taylor, on the email component? This is new this year, so it's really important that people have direct uh, instruction on this. Yeah, so if you go ahead and email me, I will probably put it into a spreadsheet. And so I will compare who sent the email and then I will compare it to who signed the application, just so you know. Uh, there will be that two comparison and the committee will get uh, a copy of that spreadsheet. So they'll be able to see it as well. So just to clarify, as we end this workshop, um, there's some new things that absolutely need to be on mind of any applicant that is going to go through this process. And one of those things that I really want, well, a couple of those things that I want to clarify one more time is what time does it, uh, does the application have to be in that has changed? It is four o'clock on Friday, October 1st. Um, anytime after that, the application is then not accepted. So we need to make sure that you see when you go in and create your account that you're using a separate documentation to answer the questions so that you can um, save all of your information on the um, digital format. And if you need to, save a draft, but we do highly recommend that you use a separate document um, to answer those questions. A new component is a video introduction. And um, Taylor, I don't believe we mentioned this, but if I understand by the nod of your heads, this video introduction has to be received also by the deadline, October 1st at four o'clock. So it is part of the application. Yes. Okay. So that's a new component into this application process for 2022, a video introduction which that video should be a four to seven minute video describing your organization, your event and pro or project, and specifically how you intend to attract tourists or tourism related travelers. Um, then the budget, we recommend that you use um, 
as much data information that you can in the budget. Please do not leave any blanks if you are especially not a startup event because you have previous numbers. You can put that in there by what date that you're choosing to use. And then please make sure that that budget does have a projected estimate in that budget of 2022. So sometimes when we get into this application process, we really worry about all the past data that there are times somebody forgets to put the actual time or budget that you're looking for in 2022. So we just want to really impress upon that. Um, let's see, what else do we need to do? Um, the workshop training requirement does not mean you have to wait till the end to do that deadline of uh, sending uh, Taylor that email. It could be today, this afternoon, before I even stop talking, you can send them and say, I went through the workshop. So, um, and most importantly, uh, all of us are here to help one another and make sure that you're a successful applicant. So if you do have some struggles during the time, previously I have always warned people, the chamber is an applicant through this process. So we ask you to not come and uh, ask us at the end of the day before four o'clock for assistance because a lot of times when you guys ask requests from us, we may not have the answers right at our fingertips. So we need some prep time to help you with those questions. So if you can definitely give us some time to assist you, I would say that both for Taylor and I, um, don't call us at 3.59 and expect us to give you an answer so you could submit your application. Um, I think that's just an honest way of saying we're here to help, but we are not miracle workers either. So on this. Um, I would say, to, lastly, uh, Madison, we want to thank you for taking the time today and doing this recording with us. Um, Madison is on an exciting career move, but still in central Washington and a very good advocate for all of us. So um, I am sure that if you uh, are close friends with Madison or have worked with her in the past two years, she is an additional person that can help you uh, with your applications if you need to be. So. Um, all three of us, uh, ladies, do you have any other words for anybody that's watching us? No, just let us know your questions early and we are definitely here to help. And the chamber is an extremely good resource for anything from beginning to end. Again, if you need preferred vendors, you're freaking out, you don't think that there's any solution to your, your problem and you can't host your event or you don't know how you're going to answer this question on the application, there almost always is an answer or we know someone or we can hold the camera for you and mic you up and help with your <laughs> video. Um, whatever it may be, definitely feel free to reach out. We um, have been a part of this process since the beginning, right, Amy? Mm -hmm. So um, we kind of know the do's and don'ts and when in doubt, call the chamber. <laughs> Well, ending this Facebook Live, we thank everyone that has uh, gone through this process with us today. This is uh, being recorded. It will be uploaded um, for your convenience. So if you need to review it several times or if it's your first time, we hope it's helpful information and uh, we hope you have a great day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, ladies.